I, I don't understand. So if, if you're doing it with a feminist perspective, you are bringing a particular bias to it, but you also believe in the goal of objective science. So how yeah. do you hold those together? I think it's very hard. I mean, I think all you can really do is acknowledge that there can be bias and see if there are ways of dealing with it. I mean, I think particularly when you're, in, in my area, when, when you're uh, looking at brain activity in, in, in different groups, um, we have this, what we call a looping problem, so that you study a particular way in which somebody solves a problem, that gets published, it gets out in the public arena, and then the next time you do those kind of tasks, somebody will say, oh, that's the kind of task I'll find really difficult, and therefore they find it difficult. And so we have this problem where, because we're studying ourselves almost, there is an inbuilt bias. So if the world out there presents, you know, the, the, what I call the Mars, Venus, Hokum, et cetera, <laughs> we know that the brain will change as, a, as a, a result of the experiences it has. So if people bring up children differently, however they claim they, they don't, but the world will ensure they do. Um, those children will have different experiences, their brains will reflect that. So we get the, bu the bias kind of being reinforced and I, th I think that's a problem. Um, and I think the other thing, just on a slightly different hobby horse, is the level of scientific illiteracy. I mean, I'm obviously talking to you know groups of, of, of converts here, but particularly in this country and in, in other parts of Europe, people will accept as gospel or evidence, something that a scientist says because it's been published in a journal. It'll get commented on, people read it in their Sunday papers or whatever, and people will say, oh, you know, the scientists have said that that's actually the case, and, and nobody holds them to account. And I think that's what feminism should do, saying this is biased, maybe accidental, maybe as a result of what we're doing, but we need to make sure people know that there is bias in there. So, are things getting any better? You know, is current practice <laughs> helping? Are there things that you commend? Do you see a positive story here, or is it just same old, same oh old? Oh gosh, it's it's hard actually, and it's interesting to see the antagonism that actually gets generated. Mm. Um, I belong to an international group, Neurogenderings is the group. We're all sort of neuroscientists of, or interested in, in in neuroscience from different perspectives, and we do our best to call out methodological problems where we see them. There was a paper about a month, a couple of months ago, proving that um, uh, infant brains were different from birth. So there's publication which was commented on, boys' brains different from girls' brains. And you know, the inevitable commentary that whatever feminists, because that's always the line, feminists might not like it, but my colleagues and I went through the data. We actually found that this had been misanalyzed, called out the authors. Um, they actually withdrew, you know, published an erratum, et cetera. But of course, that message is already out there. Funnily enough, you don't get the erratum saying, oh, by the way, you know we said this in last week's copy of the Sunday Times. You might get it, but it'd be like right down the bottom somewhere. So that's something which um, needs to be done. But actually, when you do it, then the kind of comments you get, I mean, we're also known as the feminazis because, you know, there's a feeling that we're like methodological terrorists, etc. We're trying to stop people from doing this research. Absolutely not. We're saying that this research is so important. It must be done properly because it's informing so many decisions, right, you know, from the moment of birth onwards. Um, but it, it does generate antagonism among, you know, in the scientific community as well as just generally, which is mm. slightly concerning. Mm. And Angela, I mean, you write in The New Scientist and Wired, and what's your experience there? And do you think that con the contemporary scene is moving forward at all on this? Um, in some ways, it is moving forward because of the kind of work that um, Gina is doing, and also on the gender studies side, the kind of work that Janet is doing. But we live in a very um, different political environment now. Mm -hmm. So, um, there are there is a subsection of people. I don't know how, quite know how big they are. They ha they're very vocal online. In reality, I don't know how big they are, but um, they feel able to say things now that they weren't able to say ten years ago. Um, and they're not just those crazy, you know, sexists and racists who you never you know write green ink letters to newspapers. These are mainstream scientists working within some of the best universities in the world who have very radical ideas on, on gender and on race. 
And now they feel absolutely free to say what they like because Trump is in power, because the alt-right is there. They feel emboldened. Um, so they were always there. And in some ways, they were probably always influencing what was being published in some small way. It's much easier to see them now. Um, and it is scary because as a lay person, even sometimes as an academic, it's difficult to know what you can trust out there. There are some journals, not all journals are as good as other journals. There are some dodgy journals out there that published by the big groups like Elsevier that um, publish these academic people. Journals. Academic journals that publish these people. Um, and their work is so dodgy. It, it furthers this idea that we are somehow fundamentally different. I mean, central to it all is this notion that equality is impossible, that what we're trying to do as feminists or as anti-racists or wh whatever kind of world we want is not going to happen because we're fundamentally different and that what we see now is the, bio you know, the biological reality of the world, that if women are underrepresented in certain groups or certain areas, it's because we're incapable of And is it mainly choices. biological sciences or neurosciences or are some disciplines more guilty of this Evolutionary psychology is one of the worst. Evolutionary psychology. Yeah, and um, psychology in general. I mean, as Janet was mm. saying, there is a lot of bad <laughs> research in psychology that's been proven to be bad. Um, in neuroscience as well, has it had, had its Indeed. problems mm. in the yeah. past, especially with imaging, brain imaging, and reading a little bit too much into brain scans, or maybe even then speculating based on what you think those brain scans say. So this is a real mm. problem. So I don't think it's... Bad science can be corrected, but mm. if you have this element within the academic community that actually doesn't want it to be corrected, mm. that has a agen political agenda to push and doesn't care whether the science is right or wrong, we need to worry about that because that's what we saw in the 1920s and 1930s that led to the With kind of political problems that we had then. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.